Imagine a vibrant discussion between people that includes both openness and critical thought in the pursuit of truth. The Purchasing Truth Podcast is an experience, a journey, an exploration of the impact that negative messages in politics and the media have on our families, community, society, and nation. Join your hosts, Bill Sterling and Tom Hazard, to discover new concepts and language strategies that will reveal effective ways of establishing truth. This podcast series will tackle current events, leadership challenges, healthcare confusion, integrity in business, and many other areas that affect us all. Gain clarity and understanding of the various truth perspectives. Welcome to Purchasing Truth. Welcome back to Purchasing Truth. I'm Tom Hazard, along with your host, Bill Sterley. And Bill, boy, there is a different level of truth being purchased uh, that we're seeing going on in, in Portland, Oregon, and, and maybe soon in some other cities around the U.S., isn't there? Yeah, there's a lot of pain going on. And this show is about communication and how to reduce conflict and violence and what to say or do, um, and to really watch how uh, you know, truth can be shifted uh, and purchased away from uh, us, the viewer. And, um, and there's uh, many, many examples about how language and, and uh, mayors and police chiefs and, and government officials, you know, congressmen, senators, the president can say things better to make it go better. But a lot of times that's not what they're interested in. They're not interested in getting it to go together. They're using the best thing that they, the, the only thing they have, and they think this is going to work. But really what happens is they're only getting a temporary compliance and a long-term suffering. And that's a, a, a little bit about what we're facing right now, Tom. Yeah. It's really unsettling. Um, you know, and, and the day we're recording this just, this in the wee hours of the morning here uh the mayor of portland was actually with uh a crowd of protesters speaking with them you know outside the the federal building um in in downtown portland and he was um he was speaking with the the protesters and empathizing with them uh, and you know, he was quoted. So what was the thing that he said or did as soon as somebody said empathizing with them, it's sometimes it's sympathizing with them. So let me, hmm. let me hear what the person said well, or did and okay. let me see how close it got to the bone here. Sure. Okay. So this is the quote and this was quoted by a New York times journalist who hmm. was on the ground there. Um, he said, it's an unconstitutional occupation. He told the crowd. Okay. The tactics that have been used by our federal officers are abhorrent. They did not act with probable cause. People are not being told who they are being arrested by. And you've been denied basic constitutional rights. And he goes on to say this is clearly a waste of federal resources and it's getting increasingly dangerous. So that's sort of... Okay, great. So uh, all of that stuff has some truth to it, but regrettably, it's not helpful. (laughs) Well, that's unfortunate. Now, so, so if, if you're a listener from the left, you're going to get fired up by he's on our side. If you're a listener from, from the right, we're here to stop people from destroying things in your city. To see a left-minded federal agent is saying, you, you people are doing violence. It doesn't matter if it's constitutional. I'm trying to protect property. And that's what my assignment is, is to protect property. So, so the things that he said had truth to it, And it's done, and a lot of that was sympathetic. Okay, so now let's convert it language-wise into something that's helpful. Okay. If he pulls it to himself, he would then say, I'll pretend I'm the mayor. I am as furious as you are. 
we need fairness and justice in this city. Fairness and justice looks like this. Our ability to make choice in our leadership looks like this. Just to bring truth to you, we did not request the federal officers to be here. And we're employing them to allow the state to deal with how we're engaging at the citizen level. The federal response is too large for what's going on here. We're interested in hearing from our citizens in a peaceful way. Would the president and the federal agents be willing to step back and let our local forces handle this? Thank you very much for your concern. We'll let you know if we need your support. We'd like greater support with PPE. We'd like greater support <laughs> with testing. We'd like greater support that way. Those requests we've made, the request for federal agents is a request we did not make. Wow. Now, I, I, put in the, I put in the spice and the sauce after that because you're not giving us what we asked for. You're giving us something that is meeting your needs based on the amped up media that you're seeing. Now, see, who is amping up the media on the right-hand side would be Fox people cutting together footage proving that Portland is a mess. Well, and honestly, some of the other media outlets are not, are not doing, you know, the, the left any favors either. I mean, the New York no. Times and CNN no. are proportionalizing are the, Thank you. the violence of this. They're, they're not. They're, they're, Thank you. you That's know, good scary odyssey right there. Yeah, we That's can't good just truth, lump Thomas. this on Fox News' you what, know, what? No, no, we're not. No, I, I, I yeah. appreciate that. And the reason, why, the reason why I picked on Fox there in a second, because my awareness, at least what's been reported to me, which, which has the limited awareness that I have, is that this is a station that um, Trump pushes truth in their direction, saying, well, if it's really bad over there, then I need to do something really uh, extraordinary there. And the people that are following the orders, the, the federal agents are going like, hey, we're just following orders here. And uh, we've heard and we have watched it being bad here. Instead of getting there and the commander goes, there's not enough going on here. <laughs> and the commander going like, listen, this is my orders here. And actually being proportional? No, they're not being proportional because in their mind, it has been portrayed as. Okay, now I'm going to tell a personal story, which is nothing to do with anything except for perception okay. and perspective. Personal story. I'm going to start laughing as I tell myself the story because this is not good. I was living in a first floor ap apartment in Los Angeles when one of the El Ninos came through in the in the early 2000s, there was this all this rain that hit Southern California before we hit our big drought, and we were just getting drenched and drenched and drenched. A friend of mine who was writing an article for the Christian Science Monitor said, Bill, what's your take on, I'm, I'm writing this article and I need somebody to interview, and can you, you know, tell me about what your thought is about the onion? You know, it goes, listen, I look at it, it, goes, it, you know, I have not been affected by it at all. I mean, there's a little bit more water around and there's more rain, but it's really, it's really not that big of a thing. It's like, I, you know, I don't get it why everybody, uh, the media is exploding this El Nino thing. It goes out, he puts it in the paper, you know, the, uh, Bill Sterling says media's making this thing too big. Do you know, three days after that, this big 
rainstorm hit my apartment complex and my apartment filled up with this much water, like oh, a no. foot and a half of water in the bottom of my things. I watched the water bubble underneath the glass sliding door and there was nothing I could do to stop the water from coming in and drenching at the entire apartment. I was literally picking pieces up off the ground and setting them on top of things just so just so so I could save save a bunch of things. Now the reason why I'm sharing this story at this point in time it has to do with truth and perception. It's media showing this thing and somebody at Portland might be seeing it this one way but they also might not be seeing another section that's being amplified. Now you might know, know somebody or may have read an article of somebody that is up in the Portland area that, that has that perspective of, hey, I'm not seeing this. So, so, and be ready for the perception and perspective conversation after this. So go ahead. So, yeah, this, okay. uh, it, so yeah, I do, yeah. so I do happen to have a, it's 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 one step removed for me, but uh, someone who I've known since I was 13 years old, I mean, back in junior high school, um, has a very close personal friend who lives in downtown Portland, very close right. to where this is happening. And uh, she posted um, some what what was um, billed as the truth of what is really going on in Portland today. This is how this was. This person was posting on Facebook, just sort of FYI, four-year-old information outside of Portland. Here's what's going on. And she said, and I'll try to do this quickly. She said, after the single late night in May, when we had looting slash rioting and vandalism across many downtown blocks, including our block. So this, this woman lives downtown Portland. So that, and that one night it included her block. There has been a gathering of about 100 to 300 protesters every night after dark at the County Justice Center, which is the main federal building that I guess the police and the troops have been trying to protect and all this. This protest tends to be peaceful at the start, then turns confrontational around 11 p.m. This affects maybe four blocks of downtown Portland. The Portland police yeah. and nighttime Justice Center protesters engage with each other. And at this point, neither side seems to feel like they can step away. It's been a stalemate for weeks and our city and state leaders don't seem to be able to figure out the best way to end it. That said, Oregon does not need unwanted and unasked for federal interference to deal with an Oregon problem, specifically Portland, a few, a few blocks of Portland downtown, especially when federal agents violate American citizens' constitutional rights. And this is the last statement that I find very interesting. You can't be for states' rights and condone these unsolicited federal-level actions. So I found that very interesting to hear perspective of a resident of right there in downtown Portland. Very, Oregon. very helpful. Very, very helpful. And it's a helpful slice of w w the when of their experiencing, the scope of the experience, just like Bill Sterley's rain story. And my perception in the rain story, Tom, is, is that I grew up in Florida where rain was no big deal. So my sensitivity to rain in Southern California is like, so what? It's raining. I, I grew up with rain all the way to age 18 before I left. You know, I, I, I know rain. Rain's no problem. But to people in California, rain is like, it's like a, a mystery. You know, well, that? not only what is stuff? it a mystery, but in Southern California, I mean, the newer communities are built with serious rain drainage rivers oh. that are dry 95% of the year of that's because right. our earth cannot absorb that much water in a short period of time. Period of time. And if you that's don't have correct. a way to direct that water back out to the ocean, obviously you capture as much as you can for your reservoirs and all that, but stuff, but still. it, 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 it's serious. And I was actually, I didn't live in Southern California at the time, but I was in Southern California 
I want to say it was 1996 or seven when there was like a 500 year reign here then. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. cause my in-laws were here and oh my gosh, it was devastating to the community. Devastating to the community. Yeah. So this is a great capture. So, so the reason why we're doing, uh, having this, uh, this counter narrative uh, in order to purchase truth is see, it's really, if you want more truth, you got to be specific, but you also have got to be on, uh, you know, have a, a, an honesty range. It's not, it is not, if you, if, if something has a bigger cut, you need a bigger bandaid, but if it doesn't have a bigger cut, you don't need the bigger bandaid. Federal troops in Portland, Oregon is too big of a bandaid, especially if it's not asked for. If it's not asked for, then you don't give it. That's the the role of the federal government is to be responsive, not to be pro, not to be proactive, in reference to things that the state needs to build build, build resilience around. Things that are coming from the outside of the United States into the United States, that is a federal problem. Yeah, I was going to say. And welcome to our virus. Right, well. (laughs) Welcome to the problem with the virus is the, that's a federal thing. The federal folks need to think in that bigger strategic way, not to say, hey, we're going to pass this off to the states and see how you guys do. It's like, we did not know that that was in our range of things. We don't have any relationship with anybody in China. We can't go and find out what the what the problems is. That's a federal thing. That's why, anyways. Well, so, it's interesting yeah, because one I'm, way to look at it is that the virus knows no state borders in reality, no state borders. right? Uh, and you're right. When you were saying that about what the federal role and responsibility is, I was thinking – when it comes to national security, certainly national security, you would expect that to be a federal level response. You know, somebody's coming into our shores, uh, coming in from the ocean to the shores of Oregon and making their way into Portland. Okay. Which, by the way, Portland is okay. not right on the ocean, but still, you know, there's rivers that come in. You, you know, somebody makes their way to Portland. Okay. I could see. Yeah. Okay. Let's get out the National Guard. Might need to get the military yeah, you know a, a foreign a foreign sub a foreign sub was <laughs> a foreign sub you know uh, raised above the surface you know in portland how did it get up the river you know I'm, yeah. i mean i'm <laughs> well, i know we're, <laughs> it's we're, like, we're speculating here but yeah we're, we're speculating but but it's true i mean this this response is out of proportion and i i've, I've actually thought your way uh, when you were speaking as oh. though you were the mayor of, of Portland, right? Which, by the way, his name is Ted Wheeler. When you were sort of uh, saying what he could have said differently would have really put some interesting perspective on it had he had the presence of mind yeah. to say that, you know, we haven't asked for this kind of support, but we have asked for the support for PPE and for, um, I forget what the other thing you said was, but... Um, you know, we've, oh, and, tracing, and, uh, and, oh, and, uh, oh, and testing. Yeah, we have asked for this kind of support to help, you know, protect us kind of from support, this real foreign yeah, enemy. It's, it's real foreign um, enemy. You know, yeah. boy. So, see, the, um, <clears throat> to be, to really speak in a very unsettled way, uh, it's, 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 it's unsettling. He uses the narrative that I choose, and I, I probably could have, uh, I did it off the, off the cuff because, well, that's my job, right, <laughs> to do it on the fly. But if I'm, if I'm writing that out, n- nobody will shoot tear gas in his direction. No, no, nobody on the other side, because I'm actually empathizing with the federal troops that are there, and they say, there, the the media and the, the the federal troops might be having the experience that we in Portland are having the same experience we had in May. We want to give them reassurance that although we see their presence here, it, it's not really needed, and they are valued people as fellow United States citizens, 
and we want to go back to the place where we can restore a mutual respect between officers and you know our constituents our voters our residents we want mutual respect not power over tactics would the federal troops be willing to receive i i can see president trump making his best effort because he might have seen something dangerous or two and he might be thinking that it's worse than it is it is not we are speaking up here and we were handling it within our state. I can see where he might have been feeling scared and nervous and was trying to give us safety too soon. We did not need his level of safety and protection. So he is justified by having the, tr uh, the troops move um, uh, back away from our citizens. Thanks for thinking of us. I mean, I'm being a little tongue in cheeky here right now, but it's, but it is really just acknowledging and, and seeing the effort, even though it's unwarranted, uh, unwarranted and unneeded, that how he could have took it that way. I, 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 I would imagine, and I, I don't think many people would argue with me with this truth, that the president tends to be reactive. I don't know. Would anybody argue with that? I don't think so. I think he's pretty reactive. He tweets very reactively. It's not really... So what's interesting is the the fact that the mayor, you know, got tear gassed with the protesters, the citizens of Portland by those federal yeah. troops, and that's now made the news today. It's amp it's shined a bigger light on what's going on in downtown Portland again. It's really unfortunate that the mayor wasn't prepared to make such a statement not just to empathize with the protesters there but to make that kind of statement and you know speaking to the the federal level to the administration in the white house because it would have been amplified just as much oh yeah and it would have been seen as really uh how do i say uh properly proportionalizing that this right. federal response is That's power right. over and overreaching and the federal right. government is not meeting the needs of the people in these other ways, it, right. it, it would have been much more effective. It would have, it would have. And, and this is, there's two, two tenets I usually work on is the first, the first thought goes in my mind is, um, is to be specific and to state the obvious. Those are the two things. And with a child, I am going to state the obvious. Hey, it looks like it's fun standing on top of the table like that. Now, meanwhile, I know my need for safety is not met because the kid's like one or two. Right. Hey, you're standing on the table. How does it look from that position? Isn't it neat the way it looks from that position? Yeah. So really, really, really very, very different. The kid, when you do it that way, you've just taken all the fun out of getting up on the table because you, you didn't create the forbidden few fruit of getting on the table. It just becomes <laughs> whatever. They're, they, you know, got on the table once and mom didn't really get upset. I guess, you know, I don't have to say, look, mom, I did it again. It's like, well, she saw me do it once. I don't have to do it again. And a lot of times, a lot of those behaviors go away right away if you just state the obvious and be specific. So in the communication that the mayor could have given to the federal level as well as the state level and then have some communication that could take place that the governor would say in reference to what the mayor was saying, saying, yeah, I think that you know, there might have been some over amplification here of the problem. And the belief that we needed more support than we did. Now, if we need support, we'll ask, because that's what the function of the federal government is. And in other words, I'm still framing it in a way that gives an honest perspective 
of what's going on because, you know, if somebody, if a kid is in a backyard playing with a, a, a squirt gun, not a good idea for the police to send a SWAT team for it. Right? Right. I mean, now, suppose three people call 911 and say, hey, there's a lot of kids screaming in the backyard, and I'm hearing the sound. It sounds like gunfire. Again, <laughs> the the police have got to wait for pers- to wait for truth to ke- come to them, and the nine one one person has got to ask, "Would you be willing to tell me a little more information about this truth?" Not to tilt it all the way to level ten, and then the tragedies that we have seen from that position has been really really disheartening and. And very sad too, you know the overreaction part. So we, you know, this gets us into bigger troubles about how our own physiology as a human being is getting hijacked to be on a heightened sense of safety, a heightened sense of uh, fear about our our neighbors, and that's not good business. I mean. To say that the suburbs, they're coming, there'll be no more suburbs, the suburbs will uh, disappear as you know it. It's like, are, are, are you looking at the same thing that I'm at? No, no, I'm not. I am escalating fear because that's what I've done from the start and it had me win. So I'm going to escalate fear uh, instead well, of speak truth to the reality. And he's really focusing on something he's trying to exert Fear. some control and power over when he really has Fear. demonstrated a complete lack of power to do anything regarding the virus itself. It's crazy about that. I don't want to. I don't want to be fearful about the vi- virus because I can't. I can't make it an enemy. Because if I make it an enemy, I have to do something about it. And. Uh, I mean, it's really weird, but, you know, well, this FDR, is why he's making an enemy of these Democrat cities, right? right? That's right. what he's That's labeling right. them, like That's the city right. of Chicago, the enemy. city of Portland. And- yeah, I need, I need to, I need, it's like, see, see, they haven't done it. It's like, no, they're trying to manage it from, you know, trying to get everybody to be collaborative and cooperative. But he's not doing it that way. He's looking for the enemy. And, and I mean, you know, I mean, if we think about FDR speech, uh, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Right. Yeah, Trump's got, he's the anti-FDR speech. It's you be fearful. And because you're fearful, I'll be your savior. That's what he's doing. Wow. And he gets a vote for it. A lot of them. You need to be fearful. And I have all the answers to keep you from being fearful. And people still believe that. They still believe it like they they are on the hook for it. You want me not to be fearful? Demonstrated a systematic plan for reducing COVID in every state at the federal level, give guidance, and then I won't be fearful. But blaming somebody else? No. They're just gonna wait for you to implode, which is really what's happening, because you know, you can't, you it's it's such a big thing. It's not just building one hotel and the X of thousands of people that it takes to do that. This is collaboration and cooperation at a scale that is well beyond his skill set. I mean, it's it's disturbing to say. I mean, you can build a lot of things, you know, with about two to five thousand people, but you can't well, run a nation and, like that. 
Interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, or, or a- the the same. Um, well, so we were talking about the the mayor of Portland, and and you know that he was talking to people, and he got tear gassed. Well, so earlier that same day, so the, the or the say the day before that took place, the yeah. president resumed having a coronavirus briefing here. If you see on the video, in in sort of air quotes here, a coronavirus quotes, briefing yeah. with no no one from the um, administration's task force, no Dr. Burks, no Dr. Fauci, no nothing. He, he really decided to have a briefing because there hasn't been a briefing in so long and he's trying to control the media cycle and the narrative when he hasn't been having it for a long time. And interesting, the reason I bring this up is because, you know, you just mentioned about, you know, there needs to be a national plan and response. Well, he was asked a question saying, so what is the administration's strategy to deal with coronavirus. And he said, oh, we have a strategy. We're, we're, we're coming up with a strategy. We're working on a strategy right now. So he didn't come to this briefing with a strategy, with a plan, but because somebody asked him about it, it says, oh, we're coming. We have the best strategy. We're working on that right now. We're working on it. So there was no, there was no strategy. There's no discussion of it, except that yeah. he's trying well, to purchase truth, truth and saying, we're right. making one now. <laughs> Well, it's anticipatory. That's uh, he's just using level two dopamine. So he's, it's all anticipatory set. It's like I'm waiting for see sales is about sizzle. It's not about the steak. Uh, Cause you get the steak and you know, the steak's good. It tastes good. But the sizzle by the smell of the snake, you can still avoid the, the anticipation really is almost it. better the than the rewards. Sometimes than the rewards. Yeah. Uh, that's why professional wrestling works so well. Professional work or wrestling works with is that there's a reward. Somebody's going to win this match. Very simple. There's anticipation. What's the anticipation? The, the, the people, the people coming into the, the, their grand interests with all the music that's coming in and how they get into their ring, their signature entry, their signature moves. What am I here for? Am I here to see that? No, I'm here because I'm rooting for this person and I'm rooting for this person. I mean, Trump is perfect for that environment. He's perfect to be in that environment. And he has spent time in that environment, you know, with those peeps. And they're great for entertainment. It's just that government That's what I was gonna is say. not it's theater. the same as entertainment. It's yeah. theater. And, uh, you know, I like a good theater. I like to drift away and not think about all the different tasks and details that I need to take care of in my real world, whether it's through me watching football or whatever. It's whatever your taste of entertainment, watching chess, a polo, whatever you want to do. There's... There is, there is entertainment for your thinking style. There really, really is. But it doesn't work with governance. And, and that's what we've learned through the last three and a half years is the governance piece is, is it's, just not, it's just not really helpful to us. Well, <laughs> because really the, in, in theater, it's, it's not so much about the end result as much as it is the journey, right? That's correct. Too. And, and I think too. we all recently, I don't know how many people, I certainly did, the 4th of July weekend watched the musical Hamilton, on uh, which would okay. became available on Disney+. Plus. We all okay. know, we knew from the beginning, Hamilton was going to get shot by Aaron Burr and die. You know, we knew that was going to happen. So we didn't watch it to find out the result of the story. We watched it to see the human journey along the way, the theater, the entertainment. Yes. And unfortunately, as you said, that, that story makes for great entertainment, not necessarily great governance. And um, no, it doesn't. That's, that's a problem when you have a theatrical marketer in the White House, I guess, huh? That is. Well, I, I think that we can still pulling, uh, pulling on this truth as being specific and pulling it on is, is state the obvious. 
and and really build a, a stronger needs based narrative that can really work for us and and let's keep walking down this street because there is a bit of uh, tricking the giant that I want to come back to during our next episode that okay. how to trick the giant to get it to carry us, you know, from the place we are to the place we need to be. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, the metaphor that's up again. And uh, I think it's going to be valuable. Well, I'm interested to have that discussion. I, I uh, not only about where we need to be carried now, I think we may have to also come back to that tricking the giant if Biden wins the election and Trump doesn't want to leave the White House, you're going to have to trick the giant right out of that White House, aren't you? Right out of the White House. Absolutely. We've got to definitely work on that. Yeah, that's a big thing. Uh, Yeah. All right. More to come, Tom. Thanks a million. This has been great. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this Purchasing Truth podcast. We trust that you have enjoyed this engaging and thought-provoking conversation. Our hope is that you've received value, found clarity, and broadened your truth perspective in this episode. If you did, leave us a review or visit our website, purchasingtruth.com. Join us again for another informative and content-rich discussion here at the Purchasing Truth Podcast. Don't just accept whatever information comes your way. Join the discussion. Discover your own voice. Purchase your own truth.